2 Corinthians, if you want to start there. Chapter 11. And then maybe flip over to Galatians 1. <clears throat> I'm going to say some uh, pretty strong things this morning. Not to be mean, not to be unkind or anything like that. Uh, there are some churches that have stood up for the Bible, stood up for the King James for years, and I appreciate it, I really do. But uh, with some of them, I get troubled. I get really, really troubled over what I hear and what, I, what I've read and, and things that I've seen. When it comes to me and when it comes to what I see in the Bible... There's, there's a gospel, period. One, one gospel. One good, good tidings of great joy to all mankind. And that is, our righteousness comes by way of Christ, free, by God's grace, through our faith. That's it. And to me... Every breath in the Bible breathes that. Every verse, every chapter, every section. Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter who wrote it. They're all writing of the grace of God. That's his, his uh, what do they say? His mercy, his unmerited mercy to us. Not by any works of righteousness which we have done. What does our righteousness equal in the Bible? Our own righteousness? Filthy rags. Okay, now I believe you ought to live a good life, amen, I believe you ought to live a clean life, I believe you ought to live a holy life, I believe you ought to abstain from things of this world and, and stay away from that junk and, and uh, I mean I know how difficult it is but just get away from it, but that in itself is not the gospel, living a clean life, the gospel is that God has forgiven all of your sins that have been paid for and atoned for by Christ's death on the cross. His blood has covered all of our sins on the basis of no thing that we have done other than we believe. We trust that. When I start trusting myself and I start trusting in my own righteousness and I start trusting in my own ability to do right, that's when I'm going to fail and I'm going to do it every single time. It's not going to go away. God won't let it because there's one throne and he alone sits on it. And I never will. I'll never sit where God sits. And so to me, it's a very serious issue to teach people in a, in a fundamental church to teach people that God has different gospels, different ways of saving people at different times. To me, it's, it's wrong, it's unscriptural, there's no verse that says that. There's no two verses that says that. Out of the mouth of two witnesses, let every word be established. And I have been, I've encountered that. I have had people infiltrate um, groups that we have online where people get together and they watch our stuff. Uh, I've had people infiltrate those groups to try to sow the seeds of discord of different gospels at different times. And when I catch them, I put them out. I put them out. I just, I don't fool with that. To me, that I take what Paul said seriously. Let's read it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11. And I told you we was going to be in this area of the Bible for a long time. Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly and indeed bear with me. For I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I've espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by how? Any means. You know, Paul included himself in that in Galatians 1. He included himself. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. And it is. It's very, very simple. Who in here was saved as a young person, child? Okay? 
How simple was it? Preacher preached, you believed the word. Okay? Uh, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And Paul is, he's foretelling now the state of the churches from his point forward. He's foretelling the state. He, he knows he's, um, the lady that sent me the candy, she, she sent it from Scotland, and she sent some verses of scripture in there from Acts, and Paul was given his sort of farewell deal. And he's telling everybody, I know that after my departure, grievous wolves are going to come in. And that's what Paul is getting at here in verse 4. He said, somebody's going to come in and preach a different Jesus and a different gospel, and you're going to sit and listen to it, and you're going to like it. You're going to accept it. You're going to bear with him, and you're going to think, I'm foolish. Okay? And that is the state of what's happening in a lot of churches right now. They have, they have substituted the grace of God for works, or for personal performance, or money, or merit, or any other thing other than unmerited favor from God. So anyway, he, sa he said it in very strong terms there, and then if you flip over to Galatians 1, <clears throat> verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul called that in, verse, in chapter 3, bewitching. He said, somebody came in and bewitched you. That means somebody came in with another gospel. Um, removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. See, he's telling you what the gospel is right there. It's the grace of Christ. Period. Grace. If you add works to grace, is it grace anymore? No, it's, it's works. You've got to do this. Now, you didn't do, oh, you didn't do that? Well, then you're not saved then, okay? Um, uh, verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, see, he's naming himself here, and he's saying, if we or an angel from heaven think Mormonism, uh, first morning we were on the ship, um, we sailed to St. Martin, which is a dual nation island, Dutch side and French side, and we sat down in the big breakfast buffet area, and I spotted a young man, he couldn't have been 18, 19 years old, white shirt, dark tie, dark pants, backpack on, from Utah. Okay? Mormon, and it, it was a family of Mormon, it was a Mormon family, and they were there on the cruise going out on every one of those islands handing out leaflets. And I, did, I wanted to steal his backpack and throw it over the, in, in the ocean and get rid of it. That's just me, but those guys had an angel from heaven bring another testament of Jesus Christ down, secret secret plates that nobody knew of, nobody heard of, and all of a sudden, Joseph Smith introduces a different gospel to everybody, and it's a gospel of performance. It's a gospel that says, if you marry this wife, and keep, or multiple wives, and don't be fooled, they still believe it. If you marry multiple wives, then you will get a, your own planet, you will be a god over your own planet, and you will seed that planet with your own offspring from your multiple wives. That's their version of heaven. And the divorce, I'd heard this a long time ago, so it may be different now. But what I've heard is the divorce rate in Utah is not equal to the divorce rate in other states. Because in Mormonism, if your wife or your husband goes south on Mormonism, you divorce them like dropping a hot potato. And you go find you another one, because that guarantees your entrance into the celestial kingdom. Plus, wearing the holy underwear. With Masonic sy symbols on it. Okay? It is another gospel brought down from an angel from heaven. Okay? So, that's just one example of it. Another, you could talk about the Catholic Church. Catholics are all about what the saints 
do for them. Those are the angelic, those are the people who have died, have been elevated to sainthood. They're part of the angelic realm. And every now and then, one of them will stick their head down here and deliver some kind of little message, like Mary, apparitions everywhere, or whatever. And they'll deliver some kind of little message, like, you know, you must take the Eucharist, you must go to Mass, you must say the Hail Marys, and you must do all this. That is the same idea. It's, it's what Paul's getting at. God's... This Bible is going to nail every false gospel that there is out there. The devil's not going to be able to invent one that's not covered in this Bible. Okay? So, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be what? There's only two ways of being in the Bible. You're either blessed or you're cursed. You're never both at the same time. We were born cursed, born under sin. The blessing of God came to us by way of salvation, and now we are blessed. Okay, uh, Psalm 32 comes to mind. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are covered, whose sins are hidden. That is the blessing that comes to God's people who are saved. If you are not saved, you are cursed. And Paul is guaranteeing in no uncertain terms if anybody preaches any other gospel, they are accursed. And then he says it again, verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. When the Bible says it twice, it's done. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So, there's this theory and it says that at different times like before the flood uh, during the time of Abraham maybe during the time of Moses maybe during the time of David and the kings uh, and then our time now and then uh, a time after we're taken into heaven that God has different oppositional gospels to the one that we're under now. They would say that right now we're under the gospel of grace through faith. They would admit that. But then they would say that during the time of Noah, Noah's gospel and what saved Noah was works because he built the ark. Okay? So, I'm just going to throw it out here. Was Noah saved by his works or was Noah saved by grace. How do we know? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now you go back and you look in your Bible and you look at the timing. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord in Genesis 6. Then God instructed him. First God warned him that he was going to destroy the earth. Then he instructed him to build the ark. What did Noah do? What's the first thing Noah did? He believed him. It's exactly right, Brother George. He believed what God said. Because if he didn't believe him, what would Noah have done? Perished in the flood without an ark. He would have never built it. Never done it. You see, James does not teach an oppositional gospel to what we believe. James does not teach that you must, that there is a different gospel that includes works along with grace. That's not how it is. If you believe something, you'll do it. You're doing it now. You're sitting in the house of God. Why? Who in here believes the Bible? That's why you're sitting here. Where's the Atheist League at? They're not here. They didn't come. They're not watching online saying, Amen, Brother Mike. We don't believe that at all. We're going to send you a check every week. They're not doing it. Because they don't believe it. Noah believed it. Noah found grace. God delivered his message to Noah. Noah believed it. Noah did. The works come as a result of the belief. The Ethiopian eunuch found that out. Here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now he can be baptized. Amen? But not before. 
I can't go around spitting on people in town believing that I baptized them. I spit on poor Sterling every Sunday standing down here. When I talk, if you don't believe me, you ought to see my iPad. It's awful. Don't stand around me when I'm talking. I don't baptize people that way. Mother Teresa did. She's sprinkling holy water on sick kids over there, believing that she is saving their souls from hell. That does nothing, absolutely nothing. Baptizing babies does not save them, does not guarantee their salvation, okay? Uh, christening children does not guarantee that. Um, we do child dedications, okay? That does not guarantee that that child from that age is going to grow up and serve the Lord. Nothing. Catechisms. Learning a catechism in a church, learning the answers to the questions, and then reciting them, does not make you saved. Does not, that performance does not make you saved. You can recite it all day long and not believe a word of it. We do it all the time. Okay? So, it is one gospel for Noah and for you. Because the ark... Was Christ. That's who that ark was. What about Abraham? You go read the Genesis 12. God made a covenant and a promise to Abram before he ever said he believed God. Okay? He said, In Abram and thee I'll bless, I'll bless thee, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them and curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Okay? And that was, give, that was guaranteed. Aid. What about Jacob and Esau? Which one did God pick and win? Out of Jacob and Esau, which one did God pick? He picked Jacob. When did he pick Jacob? Well, he told Rachel while they were still in the womb, two manner of nations are in thee. And he selected Jacob in the womb, Paul telling us, that God did that to signify that he did it before they had done any works. God had already, that was the election of God. Okay? Abraham, grace. He, Abraham, Abram believed God, and it was given to him, imputed to him for righteousness. Okay? And I'm going to preach on the righteousness of the saints this morning. Okay? And I'm going to jump, and I'm going to get loud, I'm going to clap my hands, and I'm going to get happy, and if that aggravates you, you just get, you're going to leave out of here aggravated. Because when it comes to the grace and the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, not by any works that we have done, I get very emotional over it. Because I don't deserve it. I do not deserve it. Okay? Uh, let's go to Hebrews 4. Turn to Hebrews 4. What about Moses? What about Moses? What did Moses do? When God, when God called Moses from the burning bush, where was Moses? Was he in Egypt? Where was he? He was out in the land of Jethro, his father-in-law. Why was he out there, George? Why was Moses out 40 years away from Egypt? He, he's on the run. He killed a man. He slew a man. He slew an Egyptian out of revenge, killed him, buried the body, and ran because he was a murderer. And God called him. God gave him grace. Did Moses believe God? When God instructed Moses to cast his rod to the ground, what did Moses do? He did it. When it turned to a serpent... When God instructed Moses to pick it back up by the tail, what did, who, here, who picks up a snake by the tail? I don't pick them up, period. Whew. That just gives me the jeebies. But he believed God. Okay? And you just take it all through, you take it all through the Bible. Um, what was the spiritual condition of Sarah when the Lord stood there looking her in the eye and told her, Time of life next year, you're going to have a baby. She in, was in the tent laughing. And then she lied about it. And he said, no, I know you laughed. 
But I'm telling you, next year, you're going to be carrying a baby. 90 years old. Okay? That's grace. What was Samson doing in the Philistine village when the Philistines were going to jump in on him and he heard about it and he went and grabbed the iron gates, put them up on his shoulders like this and went up on top of a hill and stood there like that. That's, you know what that's a picture of? You're in my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. You know what Samson was doing? He's in with a harlot. Okay? I'm telling you, it's grace. David, grace. Solomon, grace. Isaiah, man of unclean lips, grace. Jeremiah, from a child, God said, I've called you to preach to the nations. That's grace, not works. Hebrews 4. Let us therefore fear... Lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel. I learned English at Festus Elementary School. And my English teacher taught me that the was singular. Amen? It's... What is it, the article? It's called the article, right? Singular. Not a gospel, like one out of a group. The gospel. Okay? That I know of, there's like four or five Mike Hoggards in the state of Missouri. That's old information. And one of them is a dirty-nosed crook. I ain't kidding. I get phone calls all the time going... Are you Mike Hoggard? You owe us money. No, I don't. It's another guy. Long story. But anyway. But if someone says, have you heard of Mike Hoggard on YouTube? The Mike Hoggard. No, that would be me. Okay? The. Not a. The. The gospel. That's your Bible. Okay? And according to these multiple gospel people, Hebrews has a different gospel than what Paul wrote in his letters. That's not true, is it? It's not true. You read Hebrews and you're going, there it is, okay? The gospel preached as well as unto them. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. And, and I'm gonna, the, the question is, who are them? But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with what? Faith in them that heard it. If you don't believe it, you're cursed. If you don't believe it, what good does it do to preach the gospel to people who don't believe it? Just me saying it and saying the words out of the Bible does not have magic powers that when it hits you, it just purifies you just all the way and you don't, have to, you don't even have to believe it. And I've heard that one too. That's a bunch of hooey. So who are them? He tells us back in Hebrews 3. So turn back one chapter, Hebrews 3. One gospel. One gospel. Hebrews 3, verse 8. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation. You ever been provoked? You ever been pushed? Cubby, you ever been pushed? Did you push back? <laughs> Police officer getting pushed. <laughs> that kid that come in our church right before it's Sunday night service, y'all remember that? He got pulled over out here on 55 by a state patrolman. And when the cop got too close to the heroin he had, he started throwing punches on that cop. Well, the cop didn't just stand there and go, I wish you hadn't done that. He got after him. They caught him. Amen? Let him rot. Let him get saved too. Amen? The propagation. Israel provoked God. And God didn't sit well with it. God dealt with it. In the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years. 
Which one of you, raise your hand, if you've seen a lake or a river or a stream parted asunder and you walked across on dry ground? Who's done that? I haven't. Who in here woke up one morning and saw something that looked like coriander seed laying on the ground, tasted like honey? Who in here has had manna falling on their front yard and ate it? Nobody. Who in here has seen the fire of God upon a mountain? None of us. We haven't seen that. Israel saw it. Israel saw it. They saw the glory cloud of God, the pillar of cloud, every single day for 40 years. They saw it. They saw as much of God's visible presence as any man has ever seen other than those who saw Jesus face to face. And for 40 years, they despised God. And God loved them every day. He fed them every day. He led them every single day. And when it came time, here, here's the line. Here's the, here's the promised land. Here's the River Jordan. We're going to send 12 guys in now and go spy it out. They come back saying, man, it's got everything. They said, well, we're not going to go in there. I'm going to tell you something. Not everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not every church, not every church member. Okay? It's faith. So, he says in verse 18, and, to whom, and you can read all of chapter 3 if you want and make sure I'm not leaving anything out. To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that what? Believe not. So, what was the gospel back then? Belief, faith, trust, what God said. So we see that they could not enter in because of one issue, unbelief. Had they believed God, they would have entered in. But they didn't believe God, so what happened to them? They fell in the wilderness. They perished. Um, who went in? Now, let me, get, let me set this, the picture for you, Okay. Let's say that, I don't, there's like some odd 650, 700,000 Jews leave Israel, or leave Egypt. Out of that 600, 700, some odd thousand Jews that left Egypt, how many of that group walked into the promised land? Two. Joshua and Caleb. They were of the group of the 12 spies, Numbers 13, Numbers 14, that went in for 40 days, spied the land out, came back. Ten of them said, there's giants everywhere, walls are high, there's no way. We're gonna make, they're going to kill us all, we're not going in. And, is, and then here's Joshua and Caleb saying, guys, listen. God said that that land was ours. God said he'd give it to us. God said he would make those giants food for us. I don't know how that would taste. Maybe like chicken, I don't know, but God, that's what he said. God, God said he'd make them food for us. Let's go. That's our land. That's what he gave to Abraham. And they believed, and those two alone walked in. The rest of them walked in a circle for 40 years until they walked themselves into the grave. Okay? Uh, go to uh, Numbers 14. <clears throat> same gospel, people. Same gospel. Same thing. God gave them a promised land. God gave them a promise. If God makes a promise, does he keep it? The Bible says concerning Abraham, against hope, he believed in hope. You know what that means? The circumstances surrounding you will tell you you're not going to make it. God says, you already have. When April 1st, 2006, when that voltage was coursing through my body 
I submitted to death. I resigned. There's not a feeling in the world like that. When you're looking at your own death, when you can think through it logically and rationally, and I didn't have a lot of emotions tied into it for some reason. It was just very lucid, very vivid. Mike, you're good. this is how you die right here. Because I was alone. I was being electrocuted. And I knew I wasn't breathing. And I knew I was going to die. And that was it. I was done. Okay? And I resigned against hope. What I said in my spirit was, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Okay? There's part of it I've never told. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to yet, but the last thing on my mind was, I don't want to leave my wife and kids. And just like that, it's over with. Against hope, you believe in hope. And you stagger not at the promises of God. Amen? If God said it, God is not one of us that he should lie. He tells the truth every single time. And I'll serve him. For eternity, I'll serve him. Amen? Numbers 14, verse 6. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is exceeding good land. Look at verse 8. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us. See the word give? What is that? That's a gift word, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave. That's love. That's love. Okay? I got a box in my office. I hope you're listening, Mags. A sweet Scottish lady named Mags from Kilbride, Scotland, sent me a box of Cadbury chocolate. Best chocolate in the world. It's good stuff. Okay? She didn't say, now... Here's the bill, pay me back 30 days. It's not what she said. It's a gift. What do I owe her? What do I owe my wife for the love she's given me? What do I owe my children? What do what do uh, what, do, what do my children owe me for years of raising and food and bills and car payments and everything, dentist bills and medical bills and what do my kids owe me? Nothing. Why did I do it? I love them. That's why we give. Amen? If you give without love, you didn't give. Because you're expecting something in return. And God, he said, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us. A land which floweth with milk and honey. Mm. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. What is rebellion as? Witchcraft. And what did Paul say in Galatians 3? Who hath bewitched you? See the connection? You may not understand it. If you, trust me, if you, I'm not telling you to go read books on witchcraft. I have. And I know how they think. And I know what they say. And I know what their force is. And I know I can spot witchcraft from a long way away. Because I know it. Okay? And some of y'all do too. Because you you've been in it. Okay? And I'm telling you. Witchcraft, there's two religions in this world. There's Bible, there's Bible believing and witchcraft. Witchcraft is all about works and doing it right. You remember the show Bewitched? Remember that show? Remember the show with Christine? That's my favorite show on Channel 11. Grow it up, man. Watch Bewitched every day in Gilligan's Island and yeah. And you remember Aunt Clara? 
Remember what her problem was? She was the dopey witch that always she would say the spell and then a horse would show up in the middle of the living room. And then she would go, oh dear, oh dear. And she couldn't remember the spell. She didn't say the words right. So when she didn't say the words right, a horse showed up in the middle of the living room. And then she had to figure out how to undo that and do the spell right. Believe it or not, there's so much of that now in churches. You know what's required to call unto the Lord? Tears and just, ah, oh God! Just like a little child crying. Mom and daddy knows what it sounds like. And they know how to respond. They don't need the child to spell out to the adults what all they need to do. Amen? Daddy knows how to do it. We just cry to him. That's love, that's gift, that's grace. Rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. See it? I, get, I don't know how that would be, but that's what he said. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. That's it. What's the devil's biggest enemy against us? Fear. Fear. I'll destroy you, Mike. I'll tear your church apart. I'll tear your family apart. I'll rip you to pieces. Mike, I'll expose you to the whole world. Everybody will know what kind of sorry, low-down, worthless thing you are. Even though you've been telling everybody for the last 20 years what kind of sorry, low-down, worthless thing you are. I'll tell them who you really are. Fear. Fear. Remember that stuff you did? I want to tell everybody. Fear. Don't fear him. Don't fear him. Stare him down. Stand against him. Do this. Amen? He'll flee. Father, I love the gospel. I love the gospel. I love what you said in your word. And I thank you for it. God, you know, I have not deserved one thing that you've given me. I love you, Father. And I thank you for giving me what you have. I serve you today, Lord, not because I owe you. You've given this to me freely, and I understand it. I serve you because that's what you've done for me. And I'll never stop serving you. And Father, instill it in our hearts to understand the simplest thing of a gift and the giver and the love that's behind that giver of that gift. And how wonderful, sweet that is. Father, bless your gospel. Bless your word. And help us, dear God, in this church. Even these little kids who are helping to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gift given to us freely. Thank you, God, for this word and this blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, well, it's good to be back. Amen.